So, you might have seen some talk about 2017 being one of the best years in gaming. What do people actually mean by that? While the release of the Nintendo Switch and its widespread success is definitely historically significant, discussions about the best years in gaming tend to focus exclusively on game releases. Sure, the release of new technology drives innovation, but it's the games themselves that actually make an impact on us. There are plenty of solid contenders for the best year in gaming when you consider all the years in which we saw iconic and impactful releases. In 1991, we received Sonic, Street Fighter 2, Civilization, Castlevania 4, and Zelda A Link to the Past. 1994 gave us Super Metroid, Final Fantasy VI, Sonic 3, XCOM, and Donkey Kong Country. 1998 saw the release of Half-Life, Zelda Ocarina of Time, StarCraft, Baldur's Gate, and Banjo-Kazooie. More recently, 2007 saw the release of Portal, Team Fortress 2, Rock Band, Bioshock, and Super Mario Galaxy. I think it's interesting to see how these seminal releases line up chronologically, but I'm not actually interested in identifying a single best year in gaming. While that's an interesting subjective discussion to have, feel free to go for broke in the comments. I'd rather discuss some of the releases and trends that have made 2017 personally special to me. Whether or not you think 2017 has been the best year in gaming, I'm sure you'll agree that we've seen a staggering amount of high quality releases with something on offer for you, whatever you're into. Just a note before I get started, I'm endeavouring to only talk about games that I've played in 2017, so by necessity there are a lot of holes in what I'm covering. If I'm not discussing a game that's important to you, please don't take that as a spiteful omission. Chances are it's just among the many fine releases of 2017 that I haven't got around to playing yet. Twenty seventeen saw the triumphant return of a number of beloved franchises, and I think it's interesting to analyse what accounts for their success. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey are near the top of most people's Game of the Year lists. Both of those games are highly polished and meticulously crafted, but whereas Super Mario Odyssey feels like a refinement of the best aspects of 3D Mario platformers from the past 20 years, Breath of the Wild noticeably rejects many franchise staples in favour of a new, exploration-driven adventure. Importantly, both games show great reverence for the aesthetic principles and world-building of preceding franchise entries. Both games blew me away with a wealth of charming touches that added up to make game worlds that I wanted to get lost in. Over the past 10 years of my life, I have found myself distressed by encroaching feelings of just not being able to lose myself in games like I used to. Some of my older viewers have no doubt felt the same way at times. I really wasn't expecting to get into it as much as I did, but Breath of the Wild was one of those experiences that made me stop pretty much everything else I was doing in my life so I could just binge on it. My love of it doesn't just stem from the experience itself, but from the way that it reminded me that the part of me that wants to stay up playing games until my eyes hurt is still in here, buried as it may be under adult responsibilities. Anyone that experienced Ocarina of Time when it was originally released will remember the feeling of stepping out into Hyrule Field and getting a sense of the scope and grandeur of the world laid out before you. Breath of the Wild elicits these same emotions, but operates on a much bigger scale to account for modern expectations. Traversal and exploration are made into core mechanics, and the world has been so densely populated with points of interest that your journeys never feel unrewarded. In comparison, Super Mario Odyssey elicits comparable feelings of Nintendo 64 nostalgia by very different means to Breath of the Wild. Odyssey is a reminder of the sheer joy of movement within a 3D space when control systems have been designed, iterated upon, and tested to perfection. Few control mechanics come close to Mario's sense of weight and inertia. So much thought has been put into providing solid feedback and a responsive and versatile moveset that it's a pleasure working through the world's innumerable fun and varied challenges. All of the nostalgic references never feel like pandering, because they're all in service of the game's steadfast devotion to sheer, joyful fun. In discussing these games, which both forge brilliant new paths through their reverence to their predecessors, it would be remiss of me to not mention Sonic Mania. To make this game a success, Headcanon have seriously analysed what made the early Sonic games fun, and the answer is actually not dissimilar from early Mario games. Sonic games were never about speed, not really. 
I mean, Zool is a ridiculously fast game, and it feels much less pleasant to play because the sense of momentum is a bit off. Early Sonic games were all about momentum and inertia, giving Sonic a sense of weight and believable movement. Sections that you could speed through were little rewards for the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of reflex and puzzle platforming. Sonic Mania codifies and refines this structure. The video game industry prides itself on novelty and originality, but I hope more developers are encouraged by Sonic Mania's success to pursue the mantra of simple mechanics done well. Twenty seventeen saw so many games featuring unique and captivating narratives, and these were frequently narratives which could only be properly presented through the medium of games. It would be ignorant of me to claim that we had hit some milestone of storytelling maturity in 2017. Games have been telling beautifully crafted stories which can only be expressed in this medium for decades, and I'm as aware as anyone of the ridiculous ongoing battle to legitimise games as a storytelling medium in popular culture. However, I feel like I should give some special mention to the narrative experiences that I've found particularly moving this year. 2017 was a great year for interactive fiction. Night in the Woods has definitely become one of my favourite experiences of all time, through a combination of brilliantly honest and clever writing and a game world which nails the depiction of small town Rust Belt America. Playing it felt like going on a holiday, both in the physical sense of visiting a believable and charming community, and also as an emotional journey to visit certain anxieties and emotional states from my own youth. The unfolding mystery helped to keep engagement levels high, but for me, my most valued experiences in Night in the Woods were simply hanging out with friends and exploring the town of Possum Springs. Judging by the online community which has sprung up around it, Night in the Woods' environment, storytelling, and profoundly relatable characterization has clearly struck a chord with most players. 2017 also saw the release of Tacoma, the next big release by Fulbright, the studio that produced Gone Home. It makes me incredibly happy to see investigative, location-driven storytelling becoming a recognised genre. Some people call these sorts of games walking simulators because you experience the narrative in a mostly passive sense, but I don't think that does justice to the nature of gameplay on offer here. If you're the sort of person that finds pleasure in investigating and asking questions of the world around you, you'll enjoy the way that Tacoma's environment and characters have been crafted with great consistency and attention to detail. If Tacoma's sci-fi video logs approach doesn't interest you, you might prefer What Remains of Edith Finch, a story revealed through fanciful changes of mechanics and gently unfolding narration. This is a pretty ideal example of how changing art styles and mechanics can be used to depict the mental state of characters. There were a few sequences that I felt could have supported entire games in themselves, and I was pretty blown away by how much work went into sections of the game that were over in just a few minutes. Like I said, it's not new for games to feature compelling and novel stories, of course not. I just think 2017 has been a particularly impressive year on the narrative front, and we're seeing so many bold stories which could only be told through a video game medium. I've often thought it interesting that many modern studios which are described as indie feature bigger teams than the typical AAA studios of the past. For instance, in 1991, Sonic Team consisted of around 8 staff. They had a single designated programmer. Super Mario Bros. was produced by a team of 7, and that's including producer credits. Whereas many prototypical indie games have been associated with an extremely minimal number of developers, think of Derek Yu, Toby Fox, or Jonathan Blow, we're now seeing a development ecosystem which supports the existence of medium-sized indie teams, like Campo Santo's Team of Eleven, or Frictional Games' Team of Sixteen. These groups aren't nearly as beholden to the demands of publishers or investors as bigger studios, but they still have the manpower to produce heavily asset-driven games. As a result, we're seeing indie studios produce bigger and more complex projects which maintain the indie ideals of novelty and risk-taking. 2017 saw the release of many such projects, and most of these games owed their development either to respectful partnerships with publishers, or successful crowdfunding campaigns. You might have heard the oft-repeated story of the founders of Studio MDHR having to remortgage their homes to fund the development of Cuphead, but clearly, since Cuphead is remaining a PC and Xbox exclusive, 
some significant part of their development and marketing budget has been provided by Microsoft. In the last few years, we've seen a lot of projects which have been funded in part by larger studios while allowing internal development to remain indie. Other examples include Bastion, which had distribution and publishing handled by Warner Brothers, and Journey, the most notable release by that game company, funded by Sony. Something I find particularly cool is that these partnerships aren't necessarily lifelong, because digital distribution has made dedicated publishing and distribution companies less relevant. Following up the cases I just mentioned, after Bastion, Supergiant Games self-published Transistor and Pyre, and after the completion of that game company's three-title deal with Sony, they will be self-publishing their next release, Sky. Sure, this sort of working relationship is nothing new. Braid was released by partnership with Microsoft in 2008, after all, and it's as big a symbol for the indie movement as any. But with Cuphead selling 2 million copies in its first three months of release, I am hopeful that more publishers will see that allowing development studios to maintain their autonomy will usually lead to better games and greater commercial success. I feel that Cuphead's unique and immaculate presentation is a result of MDHR's uncompromising and undiluted vision. In regards to projects that stayed away from any publisher involvement, 2017 was a bumper year too. In terms of games funded through Kickstarter, 2017 saw the release of Hollow Knight, Thimbleweed Park, A Hat in Time, The Long Dark, Strafe, Divinity Original Sin 2, Ukulele, and Night in the Woods, among others. Claims that crowdfunding for games is on the way out because of a handful of poorly received releases seem utterly unfounded to me given all the amazing games that crowdfunding has produced. Again, this isn't a particularly new phenomenon, but it may be argued that 2017 has seen the greatest amount of critically lauded Kickstarter-funded games of any year so far. On all fronts, it has been a pretty spectacular year for indie games. Okay, so I'm going to break my not talking about games I haven't played rule again, because there are simply so many 2017 titles that deserve acknowledgement that I haven't gotten around to playing yet. Resident Evil 7 made the franchise terrifying again, Nier Automata has garnered tremendous praise for its storytelling and elegant design, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus cemented the spectacle shooter as a valid modern genre. Persona 5 seems to have jumped onto many people's top JRPGs of all time lists. And Splatoon 2, Steamworld Dig 2, and South Park The Fractured But Whole have provided strong follow-ups to established franchises. For every title I mention here, there are a ton I'm not bringing up too. I've discussed a few of the other interesting trends I've noticed in certain releases, but one of the things making 2017 notable was the sheer number of quality releases. I don't think there were any genres that didn't receive at least one standout release. Looking forward, it's uncertain whether 2018 will match 2017 in terms of quality output, but there's still lots to look forward to. No one can say for sure whether these games will see release, but we're expecting Psychonauts 2, Red Dead Redemption 2, The Last of Us Part 2, Yoshi, Far Cry 5, and maybe even Metroid Prime 4 or Kingdom Hearts 3. And those are just the celebrated sequels that are generating hype. Given all of the lovely surprises of 2017, I think I'm most excited for the games we don't even know about yet, the ones that will be giving us something interesting to talk about a year from now. Thanks for watching. If this is your first time to my channel, please consider subscribing to see more of these discussions in the future. I also make a whole bunch of covers of video game music, so if that's your thing, you can check that out with the cards on screen now. Take care of yourself, and I'll catch you soon.